Welcome to uh, our next webinar, the module six of the Understand Design Act, Climate Proof Your Supply Chain. How can I convince my company and others to work on CSA? Um, this is Caroline Glovka from the Global Coffee Platform. We'll just wait one more minute for uh, participants to join us and then we'll start very shortly. Yeah, so welcome, uh, what shall I say, good morning uh, to, to the States. Um, I would say good afternoon to Europe, um, good evening to Asia. Um, we have a lot of people from around the world uh, joining. Um, we are coming to sort of the end of our webinar series and we're going to look a little bit now at uh, the business case and in the next webinar, um, uh, how collaboration works. Next, please. Whoops. Sorry. Go ahead. So today we have uh, a few more uh, speakers with us um, who are going to give us a little bit of background um, on how you can convince in your company others to invest into climate smart agriculture, but also to give uh, concrete examples. So with me is Keely Sloan from Sustainable Food Lab. Hi, Keely. Um, with me is Monica Hello. Furl, Director of Sustainability from Co-op Coffees. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and uh, then there's Meredith Taylor uh, from Counterculture Coffee. Hello, Meredith. And uh, then there's Pete uh, van Asten uh, from Olam International. He's not on the video because uh, it's a little bit unstable, the connection there. So we uh, said it will be um, without the video on. And we're still waiting actually for Mark Lindley uh, to join us. So I hope he will be there in a minute. So yeah, thanks for your contribution later in the webinar today. And with that, we can move on. What are we going to look at today? Um, it's how to align climate risk to the core business and how to design and get buy-in to an integrated climate strategy. How does that work? Um, then it's maybe partly a little bit uh, repetition tools to use, um, and, but there will be also new parts in there, cost of inaction, for example, exposure mapping. We have uh, heard about that a little bit uh, earlier on, CSA practices and strategies and enablers. And then we're going to have three concrete examples from counterculture coffee, cooperative coffees, and Olam International, um, how these companies encourage investment in climate smart agriculture. Um, some of you may be new to using Zoom. So this is the software we're using for this webinar. Just to remind yourselves, uh, later we are going to have a question and answer session where you can raise your hand if you want to speak directly. But you can continuously also and are invited to put any questions in the question and answer box and we will answer those questions uh, later in the question and answer session. Your Microsoft, micro, mic, <laughs> Microsoft, your mic is silenced uh, to uh, avoid any undesired background noises. And please remember that we are recording this session so later people who were not able to participate uh, today could listen to this um, webinar. Next, please. Yeah, just quickly to look at again, you know, most of you will know this slide already, but just a quick reminder. Um, we have moved uh, through the introduction with uh, talking about um, uh, phrases, words, and terms used in climate smart agriculture. We have looked at risk profiles, tools, uh, how to scale climate smart agriculture. Uh, last time we, we looked at measuring, at monitoring, what options there are today we are with a business case this is all for the participants to understand the topic better to design a program or a project to come to act at the same time we want to we are building two cases in honduras and uganda to come to collective action at origin and uh, please show the next slide um, so 
um, we had a survey conducted uh, where people's interests are, or uh, companies' interests are, and discussed also with these uh, stakeholders which topics, which areas, uh, with whom to collaborate would be interesting, um, and uh, to finally get commitment. In Honduras, uh, this has taken the form that there are three yeah, clusters as they call them right now, where the topics being discussed are resilient coffee, reforestation, water conservation, and wastewater management as focus areas in Western Honduras. In Uganda, unfortunately, the discussion and interest is a bit slower, um, but we're trying uh, still to get a project going there. Um, if you're interested, uh, our emails will come at the end of the webinar to, to contact us um, if you're interested to uh, contribute there. We will also in the next webinar come to how collaboration work because this might even be a new topic. Um, or not so familiar. So we will cover that also in the next webinar, um, how we're uh, advancing on these two countries, Honduras and Uganda. And with that, I would like to hand over to Kili. Thank you. Apologies, I was muted. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and just as a uh, technical issues since uh, we're having trouble finding Mark, if you could just check your Skype quickly. <laughs> um, great, so why are we here today? Um, I'm guessing that many of you have joined because as someone working within or with a coffee company that's trying to design and implement a climate strategy, you're faced with issues probably with buy-in and also with implementing a strategy that can be incorporated into core business to make it both more sustainable and more effective. Um, so let's talk today a little bit about why that is and what are some strategies that you can follow to help to connect the climate risk with core business strategy to gain that buy-in. So if we take a step back to the general challenge, we see that agriculture and especially coffee companies are increasingly aware that they need to meet growing demand while also remaining profitable and sustainable in the face of climate change. Generally, as a solution, we've pointed to climate smart agriculture um, as the way to do that. And climate smart agriculture rests on these three main pillars of productivity, increased volume produced, adaptation or enhancing resilience of producers and supply chains, and mitigation or reducing GHG emissions. Now, for, um, you know, at the beginning, companies generally, generally focused on productivity and mitigation um, and are increasingly aware that productivity and mitigation do not always add up to a resilient supply chain. So we see that companies are more and more looking at adaptation instead. Uh, the challenge with adaptation is that adaptation generally necessitates long-term investment and is looking at longer-term results in an environment where short-term outcomes are generally the norm, just because of how business models work, how funding cycles work, and the pressures that can be created, especially when prices and margins are low. So let's take a look at what adaptation means. Um, so adaptation can, um, apologies. So adaptation can refer to coffee producers. Coffee producers see climate change impacts in both the short and the long term. So they deal with short term shocks such as erratic rainfall, warmer temperatures, stronger dry seasons or drought and more resilient pests and disease. Now, as these, um, as these weather variations add up, we can also look to the long term with the help of things like SEAT's climate suitability maps that are um, really helpful in understanding how farmers need to respond to these climate risks. So as we see in this map of Central America, 
uh, by 2050, a lot of these farmers are going to need to adapt practices in the green and yellow areas in order to continue to grow coffee. And then in the red areas may even have to completely transform or, or transfer out of coffee in order to make a livelihood. What we, we don't generally talk about is adaptation for coffee companies. So climate change impacts coffee companies in the short and long term as well. In the short term, price volatility can make sourcing a challenge and also can make it a challenge for farmers to be able to or willing to invest in farms, which creates problems with long term sustainability of supply and quality. In the medium term, as companies often try to switch or diversify sourcing areas, we see also increasing cost structure. And in the long term, we're gonna look again at security of supply. Um, I'm gonna bring up a, another one of SEAT's suitability maps where we see that by 2050, um, this is Central America and Brazil on the bottom, we're gonna see a lot more negative suitability changes, which are in the orange and red, but then positive, which would be in the green and blue. And in fact, in the coffee barometer, we saw that in regions like Brazil and India and Uganda, they're predicted to lose more than 60% of their suitable coffee areas by 2050. And even in the countries that are expected to see less losses, like Colombia and Ethiopia, they're still predicted to lose up to 30% of the land fit for coffee cultivation. So this is a major problem and it's, it's happening quickly. But there's still the challenge of seeing long-term investment in an environment of where generally short-term outcomes are the norm. So what's the key approach to take if you're trying to implement a climate strategy? It can be really helpful to connect climate risk with core business challenges for an integrated climate strategy. And this comes about in a couple of different ways. One is that many companies still manage corporate social responsibility and sustainability and their value chain investments separately. So we often make the case for this alignment within a company uh, in order to improve sustainability, continuity, and effectiveness of climate strategies or sustainability strategies. Now, that's often not possible in different types of companies or is just really not going to happen. So what you can do as an individual or as a sustainability team or a CSR team is to align the climate risk strategy that you think is best so that it aligns with production and sourcing strategy and with the company growth strategy as well as the sustainability strategy. And of course, having senior leadership on board and a company ethos that prioritizes sustainability is really helpful as well. So let's take a step back and look at how other food and beverage companies are looking at investing in climate change adaptation. Um, I'm going to read through just a couple of quotes that the Sustainable Food Lab collected at the beginning of this Climate Smart Agriculture project. Um, the general project incorporates coffee and cocoa. Um, and at the beginning, we surveyed uh, different companies throughout food and beverage, not having to do with coffee and cocoa necessarily, to see just on the wider range how others were looking at this. So we can look at the challenge as, as described by General Mills. Um, generally, as climate became a hotter topic and the effects were seen more, many of the especially bigger companies who were able to used, a, used shifting sourcing regions as a, as a general strategy in order to really avoid the effects of climate change and continue to source at, at regular levels. Um, but as Ellen Silva points out, you know, this strategy is becoming one of the past as sourcing areas are really all experiencing climate effects. So something needs to be done and avoidance is, is no longer an option. But as Bernard Girard says from Danone, the potential payoff can be really incredible. 
So strategies that promote resilience, such as climate smart ag practices, can have the double effect of alleviating poverty, which would be a win-win for farmers and companies alike. And then from Duncan Pollard from Nestle, we see an encouragement for collaboration. Now, collaboration can be key in several different ways. Uh, one is that on, on particularly challenging issues such as identifying, managing climate risks and coming up with the tools and resources to do that, um, it's really helpful to have a lot of companies and a lot of actors working on these things, otherwise you're just not gonna get to the solution. But on the other side, we also need a whole sector shift in order to um, see desired impact on the ground. We know that we're always gonna have a few companies that, that start to invest sooner um, and see this as a priority sooner, but that can be uncompetitive if it happens for too long, especially as activities are geared towards longer term results. So, the, the whole sector shifting, then you're able to actually see that impact on the ground. And this is where the role of sector alliances and platforms is really critical and why initiatives like this from the GCP to invest collectively at origin are so important. Um, and then finally, especially depending on the role that your company plays in the supply chain, this is often the best path forward to catalyze impact and leverage resources. And finally, the business case. So companies are steadily realizing that climate risk is not something that will go away and that investment now will save money in the long run. And this is really something that you'll hear reinforced by everyone that's gonna present after me. Um, and so the, the point that Paul Pullman from Unilever is making is that the cost of inaction is really higher than the cost of action. So although it, you still have to sell it since it's going to be a long-term outcome, um, it really fits with most business models. And with that, I'm hoping that someone from SEAD is on the line to explain this. Caroline, were you able to get in touch with Christian? No, I'm afraid not. So as um, you mentioned, these slides are very are more um, on the scientific side. Um, I suggest that we skip them and uh, go straight into uh, the cases. Okay, well, I have a little bit more to present on. Apologies to everybody. Yeah, um, un unexpectedly, uh, Mark Lundy probably is um, stuck in traffic or something. Um, otherwise, uh, he would have been here. So this is a bit of a surprise, which I'm really sorry for everyone. Um, but Kili, then why don't you move on with what you have and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go to the cases. Okay, great. I mean, just to talk about this slide a, a little bit, um, it is fairly self-explanatory, you know, with the, with the climate projections that SEAT has, you can see what the annual losses of suitable, of suitable land will be. These are for cocoa in Ghana. Um, I believe they have data on cocoa in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire right now and are currently working on, um, on coffee data. So you can see that without, without investing in climate smart agriculture, you're going to continue to lose this, this suitable land and farmers aren't going to be able to adapt and will have to necessarily um, switch out of coffee or cocoa in this case. And here you see on the right that the potential losses could amount to one third of current production. Um, and so that puts a, a real emphasis on how we are going to um, continue with a sustainable supply of cocoa or, or coffee. Now, while cost of inaction, um, while cost of inaction really relates to all companies, the action that your company can take 
differs depending on the role your company plays in the supply chain, the climate risk faced in particular sourcing areas, and the coffee segment at hand. So whether your company is buying specialty or certified or bulk can all have um, can all have an effect on the type of strategy and tools that, that your company has at its disposal. Now, understanding and, and building these differentiators into your strategy will help you to tailor it to, to gain buy-in. So let's look at the key drivers for climate smart agriculture investments. We usually see these uh, as long-term supply, as reputational risk, or as quality. So long-term supply, we've been talking about for, for quite a bit. Um, there, is this, there is a fear that companies will not be able to source from the areas that they're currently sourcing from. Reputational risk can apply either to the end consumer who wants to know that the coffee that they're buying is not having a negative effect on the planet, or even companies further up the supply chain that are buying coffee um, that want to know both that the, the supply is stable and secure and also that there's not a negative, um, there's not a negative uh, effect on the planet from the coffee that's being sourced. And then, Finally, quality is a primary driver for many coffee companies and climate can change can be a real threat. So this, is, this can be a real in for a climate strategy. And that brings us to our next point. Depending on the role of the company and the clientele and the coffee segment, um, you're gonna have different entry points. So again, um, oh, and I see that Christian has joined us, <laughs> so I will have him maybe go back. Uh, let me finish this, and then I'll maybe have him go back and talk a little bit more about cost of inaction, and thank you, Christian, for joining. Um, so the um, entry points for, for different companies are going, to, are going to be different, and the key is to find an entry point that aligns climate risk with core business risk. So for instance, if you're sourcing coffee in Vietnam, you know that water stress is a central challenge to business. Um, and that can be a really good entry point to build an integrated climate strategy around. Uh, changes in coffee land use suggest that deforestation is a primary source of new coffee lands. And that can be a huge reputational risk that may drive investment. Or to take a past example, in Latin America, Roya spurred a massive shift toward investment in climate adaptation as companies saw that farmers who had adapted saw much fewer effects from Roya than those who had not. <laughs> and with that, Christian, I wonder if you want to go over just the cost of inaction slide for a little bit, if you are willing and able. So, yeah, uh, thank you, Christian, uh, for coming in uh, at short notice, and um, I hope you will be okay <laughs> covering Mark's slides. Thank you very much. That's super grateful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so, cost of inaction, we wanted to know uh, what would happen in a uh, no action scenario, hypothetical up scenario in which uh, no intervention is done. So um, our, our climate models are always no action scenarios. It's a statistical approach. So it never assumes that we are able to expand uh, the, the tolerance of our production system uh, into the, the new uh, conditions of the future. So we, um, uh, it, it, took weeks and months to get a full data set of uh, cocoa sourcing uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, these are, uh, these, this, uh, this is based on uh, CocoaBot um, reports of um, the quantities produced in the cocoa collection districts. And we overlaid that with the most likely climate impact scenario 
um, according to the climate models. As you understand, there is some disagreement between global climate models, and we looked at the most likely scenario um, that uh, represents the, the, the degree of change that would happen without action. And we see some regions um, where the climate remains highly suitable and the, the changes are not that significant when you compare it to the resilience capacity um, sort of the, the, the slack that the system still has, the, the capacity to buffer some of these projected changes. So there we, we say, look, it's, it's just going to get warmer. So um, we need um, maybe a little bit more pest and disease pressure, and that would amount to perhaps 10% uh, of, of, of losses annually if we don't do anything to confront these new, new losses then uh, there are regions that will signific uh, see significantly more uh, drought and heat as we've seen in the past already uh, reducing the cocoa crop. Um, and uh, um, based on our literature research, we uh, uh, decided that it would be reasonable to um, uh, an estimate losses without action somewhere in the range between 30 and 50%. And then finally, towards the savanna, where actually there is little cocoa produced, there is little area um, that's productive. But this is the area that um, where we think uh, without climate action, uh, cocoa trees would simply die off and uh, we would have to talk about a complete loss of, of cocoa production. Um, because without uh, sustaining um, interventions, uh, the, these, these trees uh, um, just uh, suffer uh, strong drought conditions in the future. So um, we added these scenarios up uh, and um, estimated um, affected households to be somewhere in the range of uh, 90,000 households going out of production, 350,000 households um, being heavily affected and only um, about 200,000 households being a little bit better off in the sense that um, uh, they have some potential to tolerate the projected climatic changes. And, uh, uh, and, and if you express that in metric tons, it's 270,000 that could potentially be lost without a dipation offer. So that, that's your, your, your benchmark uh, at which you can measure the cost of your intervention because that's something that that's a hypothetical loss without adaptation and um, that, that that is the uh, so the, the, the long-term supply risk that uh, we see for in the here in the, the Ghana example and uh, now I'm not sure if I have to cover anything else or can I just stand <laughs> back to Keely you can hand back to me. I may I may ask for comments a little bit later on, but thanks, Christian, for jumping in. That was uh, much better than my my explanation of this slide. So I really appreciate it. Um, and I think we can all see how this can be really compelling data to encourage company investment, as it really amounts to um, both supply and and profit loss to lose these sourcing regions if you're not taking any action. And with that, and you know, we we talked a little bit about different drivers and and entry points for companies, but it also makes a difference. Um, it also makes a, a difference depending on the type of company you work for. You're going to have different goals and tools at your disposal, um, and that generally depends on what role you play in the supply chain. So thinking through this can also help you to frame the opportunity to invest in CSA to fit your company. Um, if you've been participating in, in these webinars in the past, you may have already seen these three categories of, of coffee companies divided into direct service providers, collaborators, and catalysts. Um, so if you're a direct service provider providing services directly to farmers, you're probably going to be looking for partners with good analytics to help with gathering and use of timely information. And the questions that you're going to be trying to get at or solve for are, what are the most serious weather-related challenges farmers face and what are the corresponding climate smart practices to promote resilience? And then how do you get farmers to adopt those practices? 
So this is really practice based. The collaborators are those who share the burden of service provision via collaboration a bit further up the, up the supply chain away from producers are going to be looking to find like minded companies or NGOs that are either working in similar geographies or working on similar problems to increase impact. And they're mainly going to be looking at how can you leverage resources to provide knowledge and support to build climate resilient strategies. And then the, finally, the catalysts who really spark action at a sector or a higher level with a lighter touch on the ground or at least within their, their own supply chain, they're going to be looking to work pre-competitively to unlock solutions with the potential for big impact over broad geographies. And they're mainly going to be trying to solve for what are the major climate risks that farmers face in the long term and what are the enablers needed to build resilience. And how do we get the information and resources to farmers and service providers across geographies? So this can all help you to, to frame your, your climate resilience strategy. And um, we're gonna take a closer look then at how this fits into practices, strategies, and enablers. So, Practices are implemented on a farm to adapt to current climate variability and to a lesser extent to prepare for climate change and include such tools as cover crops, shade management, distancing, and trenches. So uh, direct service providers are, are in the best position to be able to influence these, these practices. Strategies implemented on and off the farm within the producer organization, community, or supply chain that adapt to current and future climate challenges. Um, these include diversification, choosing resilient varieties, and changing processing methods. And finally, enablers are supported by actors on and off farm to establish the conditions needed to implement CSA strategies and to adopt CSA practices. So these are kind of the bigger things that maybe catalysts are, are most able to tackle, such as financing, weather insurance, weather stations, and innovations in payment terms to promote CSA. So first, and you know, we've been over these climate um, maps a lot. These again are the CEOP suitability maps are used to really understand the climate risks faced in your company's supply chain. And these are split into incremental adaptation, systemic adaptation, and transformational adaptation. So how much do farmers need to adapt in order to um, either continue producing coffee or to make a, a, um, a decent livelihood doing something else if they need to change from coffee. So incremental adaptation is where climate is most likely to remain suitable and adaptation will be achieved by a change of practices and ideally improved strategies and enablers. Systemic adaptation is where climate is most likely to remain suitable, but with substantial stress through comprehensive change of practices accompanied by changes of strategy and adequate enablers. And transformational adaptation is where climate is likely to make coffee production unfeasible and will require a focus on strategic change and adequate enablers as practices alone may be uneconomical. And you can see that we've put this together and we've taken systemic change here. Um, there are other graphs in the in the uh, resources section for incremental change and transformational change, but this gives you a good idea so you can go back and look later um, of what kind of practices we see at the farm level, at the producer organization level, and then at the trader or roaster level and how um, those practices can, can lead into strategies and enablers. And so what tools you really have at your disposal as a company um, to affect change at the farmer, producer, and producer level, um, depending on whether you're better able to influence practices, strategies, or enablers.
And then the last thing to, to think about, and Christian, feel free to join in here at any point if you see that I'm missing something, because these are um, uh, these are all of Mark's slides. But um, the other thing that that you're going to want to look at is the segment of coffee that you are that you are working with. So if you are buying bulk coffee, you have a lot of producers, which means that you probably have lower margins and are probably able to invest less, but be able to um, impact across a, a greater amount of producers. Um, and then as you get into certified coffee, that's gonna become fewer producers with more margins and probably more money to invest and more, um, and uh, more ability to influence practices through certification. And as you get to the very high quality coffee or the specialty coffee, the margins will be higher and there will be more money to invest in, in quality for fewer amounts of producers. Um, so just understanding the restraints of the coffee segment that you're working in can be really helpful. And with that, we're going to look at how three companies invest um, or approach investment in climate smart agriculture. So we're going to hear from Meredith Taylor from Counterculture Coffee, Monica Furl from Co-op Coffees, and Pete Van Esten from Olam International. And we will start with Meredith. Hi, everybody. Um, and thanks for having me on the webinar today. Uh, if you have not heard of us, Counterculture Coffee, we are a roaster uh, in the US based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we are just a roaster in the, in the sense that we don't have our own, um, we don't have our own cafes. So a lot of our volume goes to wholesale. So selling to cafes and restaurants, um, we also sell into Grocery Channel and uh, a growing e-commerce kind of online direct to consumer sales. Um, but we do, you know, we just sell, just sell coffee. So uh, that's us. Um, you know, as far as the, the categories that Keely just talked about, um, we are in that, I think that the first one, the top one there. Um, so the kind of the high end of specialty, um, which means that, uh, you know, our, our band of quality that we buy is probably a bit more limited um, in scope than some other folks. Um, and yeah, just kind of setting some context there. So uh, we buy coffee through long-term partnerships. So, um, you know, we, it usually takes a few years um, when we are, start buying coffee from a new place. Um, to kind of work out whether it's going to be a good partnership on both sides of the equation. But um, our intention, uh, once that decision has been made, is to buy coffee from the same people, um, the same you know, co-ops, farmers, um, washing stations every year. Uh, of course, we always have to add more as volume grows, um, but all of this to say, uh, we become very invested in these partners. So we spend a lot of time uh, and money, um, kind of building the partnership, building the trust, um, and investing a lot, uh, usually, you know, up front uh, at the, in the quality of the coffee um, that's coming from that, uh, that farmer or group of farmers. So, like I said, our band of quality um, is pretty specific, and so uh, a lot of the investments, um, direct investments that we do at the beginning of a partnership and you know honestly throughout um, relate to improving the quality of the coffee or um, kind of segmenting sorting out the quality of the coffee um, and working on the um, consistency of quality from that partnership so um, you know that very much drives the our investment on the quality side um, and you know that's also drives our investment on the sustainability side. So, you know, because we want to buy from the same people next year and three years from now and five and 10 years from now, um, and because we're investing a lot on the quality end of things, um, 
you know, we want to protect those investments um, if you want to look at it from a kind of business sense. So um, that is where a lot of our sourcing sustainability um, investment comes in is protecting the quality investments. And uh, we take a pretty wide view of, um, of what that might mean. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that quality investment um, because I think, you know, bear with me because it's going to apply to how I talk about the sustainability investment side of things. Um, so when we're thinking about how we invest in quality in a particular supply chain, a lot of it has to do with um, how do we reduce the risk to that farmer or farmer group of doing whatever practice that we're asking them to do. Um, and a lot of times that's tied to money, right? So, um, you know, first there's uh, a guarantee that a higher quality coffee will uh, get more money. So I don't think that's, you know, anything revolutionary there, but knowing that um, if the, whatever quality practices are doing do result in a higher quality coffee, then the, the price will reflect that. Um, kind of the next level is to, uh, when we want someone to do a new quality practice or particularly um, more things on the experimental side of things, uh, we will invest or we will commit to buying that coffee up front regardless of the outcome of the experiment. So a good example is um, in Burundi, uh, there was a washing station we've been working with for years and we wanted them to try to make natural coffee. Um, that's something they hadn't done before. So we said, if you do this, um, we will pay for the coffee, it doesn't matter how it turns out. So again, taking away the risk of doing that. Um, kind of a more common across the board type of investment um, is buying equipment or um, types of infrastructure for farmers that we know, uh, you know, we're, we're based on experience, um, we know that they're gonna result in better quality practices. So um, this doesn't have to be big things. So a lot of uh, what we've done in the last year or so is um, give pretty much everyone that we work with a moisture meter and a UV light um, and taught them you know, how we use those two pieces of equipment to do our physical uh, green grading. Um, and so how they can use them as well. To, to do the same types of things uh, at the, on the origin side of things. And so all of that um, has absolutely led to better quality, but um, also more consistent quality. And then finally, um, in a few cases, uh, and hopefully more going forward, um, we have been able to build the price of a quality practice into the price per pound of the coffee. So if we say, you know, we want you to dry the coffee to 11% moisture, let's say. Um, and the farmer says, well, you know, that's one or two percentage points lower than what I usually do. So uh, I'm going to make less money. So I need you to um, make up for that or compensate that in, for that in the price of the coffee itself. And so, um, you know, that is kind of what I would uh, classify is the ideal situation where, um, you know, we're asking for a practice. The farmer says, this is how much this practice is going to cost me. And we say, great, we'll build it into the price for the coffee itself. Um, okay, so all of that to say, uh, that's what we do on the quality side. I'm going to come back to that. So Keely, can you go to the next slide? On the sustainability side of things, um, I'm going to talk just about the sourcing sustainability. Um, you know, our, it's really important to us to have farmer identified uh, interventions. So, you know, we talk a lot in the industry about practices, about technology um, and implementing them. And it's important, I think, to realize that always on the other end of any practice or technology is a human. So um, what we're really talking about is uh, behavior change. And I think one of the most important parts of that is um, having the people whose behavior you're trying to change bought in to uh, whatever you're asking them to do. So there's a lot of ways to do that, um, but that is kind of the driver behind our ethos. 
um, that it's important to have the, the farmers themselves involved in the process of choosing what practices that they want or they want to do and they can do. Um, and that has taken uh, different forms over the years. Um, but, um, and here's where I'm going to get back to the quality side of things. It's always been what I would call kind of uh, extra or on the side. So um, a program where we give small grants to people that we work with um, for sustainability projects that they identify. Uh, it's great. It's successful. It's, it's um, gotten some really great projects out of it, but you know, it's, it's still this kind of coming in from the side and um, putting maybe um, a band-aid on something. Um, it's not built into our systems for quality necessarily, and it's not built into our systems for, for pricing. So, um, you know, that is, I think, what we are after. Um, so coming back to kind of those uh, ways that I've listed for how we invest in, diff in quality. Um, so again, having a price tied to sustainability, like you would have a price tied to different quality tiers. I think we do this, you know, this exists to some extent through certification. So, you know, paying more for an organic coffee than you would non-organic coffee. Um, but it doesn't really go down to the practice level. So it's either the certification or not. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not a, a complete way um, to pay for practices themselves. Um, you know, we haven't really done an um, experiment with this sustainability practice and we'll pay for your coffee no matter what. Um, you know, equipment and infrastructure, you know, saying we'll, we'll buy or we'll pay for these things that we know will help you be more sustainable. Um, again, that's what that, that grant program has achieved in a lot of places. It's the, um, the infrastructure to get, um, you know, which is often the upfront cost for a sustainability project. So, you know, it's kind of working there, but um, where we would really like to go is to model what has, you know, where we're going on the quality side of things, which is to build the cost of doing a practice. So in this case, a sustainability practice into the price of the coffee itself. Um, and, you know, for us, this is kind of the ideal. Um, again, it gives farmers that autonomy to say, this is the practice that um, works for me. So uh, instead of saying it's either a certification or not, um, saying, well, you know, I can make and apply compost on my own farm. That's something that I can do. And so uh, it gives that ability to choose based on um, interest and also on feasibility. Um, and, you know, for us, it helps us build if we if we're able to build the cost of these practices into the price of the coffee, then we're on the kind of our accounting end, we're able to build it into the price of coffee. And that takes it away from being that kind of um, investment coming in on the side and rather shifts it to thinking of, you know, this is just the price of coffee. So um, not only are we paying for quality year to year, but we're also paying uh, and enough for farmers to invest in kind of the security of the, the long-term security of that quality. Um, but this has its challenges and this is why we haven't quite uh, figured it out yet. So um, the first is how much does it cost to do, you know, whatever sustainability practice um, you're talking about. I don't think that doesn't seem like an insurmountable thing to me. Um, I just don't think that the information exists quite as much as it does on um, how much does it cost to dry and raise beds versus on a patio. Um, so part of it is, you know, what would the cost be to build into the price? Um, and another tricky part of it is how do you know that the practice is being done? So if someone says, I'm going to uh, start making and applying, like making my own compost and applying it. Great. It's going to cost $100. Great. Um, now, how do we know that that's actually happening? You know, without the certification type system, there is no, uh, you know, people going around doing on ground verification necessarily. So um, I have been thinking a lot about and talking to people about um, 
possibilities related to remote sensing or different types of agricultural technology that might be able to uh, help overcome this challenge. But again, at the moment, um, definitely a, a big barrier. Uh, the other, another big thing is price traceability. So if we set, you know, again, with the, I'm gonna stick with the compost example. Um, it's gonna cost us a hundred more dollars to do this, great. Um, you know, we're, we're, if we wanna build that into the price, really as a roaster, what we're gonna be doing is paying the importer. So how do we know that uh, if we, you know, that means that that hundred dollars means that we add five cents per pound onto the price of coffee. Um, that five cents actually gets down to the farm level um, because that's the, that's the intention, right? Is to pay the farmer for the practice. Um, and then finally, uh, and this kind of goes more towards making the business case, um, you know, I think it's easy to invest in quality because uh, there's a mostly objective way to measure it. So if you say like the coffee was 82 last year, we did X, Y, and Z, and this year the coffee was 85. That's a very um, kind of easy case, right, to make. Um, less so with sustainability. So not only uh, is there not really a standard way to say the sustainability went from 82 to 85, um, but a lot of these investments I don't think will necessarily involve uh, an increase in quality or even in productivity. Um, I think a lot of times we are investing in practices that are more for avoided loss. So how do we maintain the quality and the productivity that a farm has now? So um, that is where I'm going to stop because I'm over time and hand it off to Monica. Thanks so much, Meredith. That was super interesting. And I think uh, if we have time at the end and anybody has, um, has ideas on how to build sustainability practices into the cost of coffee that all of us would be very interested to uh, to hear that and and if anyone has any answers to some of other, Meredith's other questions that, that would be great as well and with that I will pass it off to Monica Furl of Co-op Coffees. There we go. Hi everyone and uh, thanks Keely and thanks everyone at uh, Global Coffee Par Platform for facilitating this conversation and also for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about co-op coffees and what we're trying to do in this um, big and mysterious world of uh, sustainability and coffee. Uh, so co-op coffees, we are a cooperative of coffee roasters who've come together in order to create their own importing arm. So we're fair organic and direct and um, we were founded in 1999 with a handful of roasters. We've grown to 23 roasters across the U.S. and Canada. And, um, and the organization was founded on the premise that coffee can be a win-win endeavor for traders, roasters, and producers. And all of our purchases are coming from um, fair trade, organic, small-scale farmer organizations, and with these direct relationships. And... Um, I guess I would always say that our greatest assets are the relationships that we've been able to build over the years with our producer partners and also between roasters and producers. And some of these relationships go back 18 years to our founding. And what that means for us is um, that a lot of years of investment, time, money, um, energy, sweat and tears, um, investing in strengthening communications and aligning quality expectations, site visits, shared experiences, etc. cetera. So um, as a result of that, some of our coffees are actually unique to our roasters. Um, so the risk for us would be um, not necessarily what happens if we might add a little more to our price in order to meet farmers needs, but actually what would it cost us if we had to replace those relationships and that supply chain. Um, so um, can you maybe move down to the next slide. So, of course. This map I think everyone in the coffee industry has seen this map and you know with the projections from research, 50% of coffee regions will no longer be suitable for coffee production by the year 2050. And you know, the millions of coffee farmer families who will, of course, be suffering from that. 
And um, that message really hit home in 2013 when some of our, um, we can go ahead to the next slide, um, some of our most trusted long-term partners were really struggling with Roya, with the leaf rust crisis that, that swept across um, Latin America. So, you know, we had been down there, we'd been hearing from producers, we'd been hearing from roasters, and we were seeing what was happening. And, um, and so, of course, we were concerned. And I think our true aha moment was uh, the second circle is Oscar Alonso of uh, Marcala Organica Comsa. And to be in Honduras and in the midst of this Roya crisis and see his fields surrounded, what we're looking at in front of his hands are the neighbor's fields, which were very um, devastated. And behind him were his own fields that were just teeming with coffee. It was the best coffee production I'd ever seen. And, and that just kind of stopped us in our tracks in saying that um, we have farmers who are doing amazing work to prevent some of the, the most severe impacts of, of climate change. And so really simply in reaction to a crisis, we, uh, we added what we called the Roya premium at the time, so five cents per pound, particularly with the most hard hit organizations. And we tried to bring that knowledge from one producer group to another. We invested in projects that they deemed would be helpful, but a lot of the money went into helping farmer organizations gain access to information, um, site visits, hands, hands on training. And we actually used our internal supply chain to help teach each other what was working. So um, next slide. And so that was a short term, um, but it was, it was quick. It got resources down. It, it, it got people activated and, and we saw a positive impact. And so that got the attention of the Coffee Farmer Resiliency Fund, which we were invited to join. And that also helped us to leverage. And then, so we were able to move some of that sort of emergency fund money um, into a larger fund with match funding. And so we were able to do other things. Um, again, a lot of it linked to some field renovations, learning and exchanges, and also some of the groups hiring organically trained and oriented agronomists to help them really begin exploring with very localized, um, you know, changes in, in um, production and, and the treatment of their coffee at their trees and, um, and processing. Um, and then on to the next. And, uh, and so through all of that, what we started to understand ourselves is that um, these issues in the fields, it might be Arroyo one year, it might be a different um, you know, crop loss due to a pest or a different illness. Um, it may be, it, but so much of this, what was, what was shifting in a positive way was when farmers were beginning to understand the power of uh, strengthening their soil, sort of their, and their, their ecosystems, very farm, um, farm local, and creating, inoculating their fields in order to create more internal resiliency. And, um, and so the more we began seeing this, the more we began to realize that the big issue is climate change. It's not just an illness or a varietal, um, but how can we create more of a systematic approach? And so we started this carbon climate and coffee initiative, which essentially is um, coffee roasters and importers uh, trying to take responsibility for our part of the contribution, the negative contribution to, to climate change. So compensating for our emissions. And so we have calculated our carbon footprints. We'll be doing this on a yearly basis. And what that turns out to be to try and offset some of the emissions and create an investment is a three cent per pound carbon tax that we're now putting on all of our green coffee. And so what that does is gives us this rolling fund in order to be responding, but in a bit more of a programmatic way. Um, and we're, you know, so facilitating longer term work, um, facilitating and, and deepening this connection between producers so that they can, you know, 
continue to, to learn and to experiment um, pilot projects. And um, then if I look at, so if I looked at what Keely was talking about, what's, you know, what kind of an actor are we in this scene and, and what's been our role, I would say we've kind of gone through the range of, you know, some direct, um, direct action. We've been trying to be collaborative. And, and now we're also seeing that this fund is helping to be a catalyst um, and just facilitating some of the pilot project work and, and greater access to real life experiences that other farmers are experimenting with is, is catalyzing new ideas and, and some of their producer partners now are exploring on their own different ways that um, they can adapt to the different kinds of, of um, advice they're giving to their producer members and how this is, is beginning to change not just the practices, but I also think it's beginning to change the roles, that there's a power shift, there's, um, there's an acknowledgement of the, um, of the wisdom and the capacity of farmers. And, and that's something that I think has been really great to see farmers taking charge and pushing us to do more. So on the one side, Roasters are willing and, and eager, actually, to take on their responsibility, and, um, and farmers are pushing us to do more of that. So um, I guess I would just leave it at this for now, I'll leave a few minutes for Piet. And, um, but I would say in the result of this has been sustained supply, um, stable and increasing quality, and, and, and much stronger relationships. I think we've really grown to have a, uh, a stronger bond and a greater appreciation, mutual appreciation for each other in, in all of us trying to step forward and, and tackle in the way that we can this increasingly um, desperate climate situation and, uh, and trying to do something before things really get too late. So, so thank you. I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Monica. That was really great. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Pete Van Esten from Olam. Hi, Keely. Can you hear me well? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay, I'll try to keep it short against my nature. So, um, what maybe because I was hearing the others, of course, introducing the company, maybe I'll have to say a little bit about Olam. Of course, we are in the contrary, quite a big, you know player that works a lot also with, of course, volume. We've got specialty teams in coffee as well, but uh, Olam is based in Singapore, is um, listed on the stock market there, is operating in 66 country, has 72,000 staff, is sourcing from 4.7 million farmers, and basically has leadership positions worldwide in edible nuts, cocoa, coffee, spices, cotton, and rice. So we are a big agribusiness uh, player, and we have quite an inspirational uh, leader, uh, Sunny Verges, who is currently also heading the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And our basically purpose, uh, we've got a nice slogan for that, is called Reimagining Global Agriculture, Growing Responsibly. So um, really, you know, the whole issues around sustainability, climate change, and um, climate smart agriculture is high on the agenda for Olam. And, uh, but primarily, of course, also to protect our own a position and reduce the risks and also of those of our, our 4.7 million suppliers, farmers that we have. Yeah. So um, this uh, may be, well, in the sustainability areas, uh, sorry, I already said climate change. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there is also quite a bit uh, of uh, effort nowadays from Olam since agriculture actually you know, has a, or is responsible for 24% of the total greenhouse gas emissions globally. Actually, Olam has made a real effort to try to set high-level targets of our own carbon footprints and operations, and CSA, of course, is a direct part of that. So, for example, we have committed that we should be reducing our carbon of our emissions by 50%. Now, these are extremely ambitious targets. So, anyway, we're trying to work hard how to do that. And so, of course, investing in CSA in coffee and cocoa to our smaller suppliers is an extremely important part of that. So, how do we do that? We basically train farmers through our field teams. Uh, Olam is actually 
I think he's a bit proud. I've been now for the company with the company for for almost getting to two years soon, and and I think uh, you know Olam is very proud that uh, we are actually sourcing on the ground. So we have large teams, you know, in in West Africa, for example, sourcing uh, cocoa, in East Africa, sourcing uh, coffee, but also in many of the other countries. And they're actually, as we source this coffee, these people that basically help sourcing the coffee also provide extension services and increasingly use that also using digital tools. By now we've got about half a million farmers digitized, you know, uh, so we've mapped them out, know where they are and try to track their production, but also provide, you know, knowledge inputs and sometimes even credit through the mobile devices. And uh, where we don't work directly with farmers, we are currently trying to explore how we can use our LBAs to be the service provider. So in many cases, we also will buy uh, produce through uh, local buying agents. That's what LBA stands for. And they are actually the ones that are directly reaching out to the farmers. So why not give them the tools, you know, as well to try and, and support the farmers. So that's just a, a way of trying to leverage and, and reach as many farmers as possible. And then one important aspect is as well that, of course, the bulk of our, our volumes that we trade basically come from the, the farmers, the coffee farmers and the smallholder farmers, of course, as well. Uh, but we also have our own coffee plantations uh, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. And we actually do quite a bit of R&D in terms of uh, climate smart agriculture. So we do quite a bit of work now on post-harvest um, waste management and trying to reduce anaerobic um, uh, decomposition, which is uh, accounting almost for 40% of the carbon footprint of coffee. So we try to do away with that anaerobic decomposition of our waste products um, uh, by finding alternative ways, you know, of returning these residues uh, back to the field more quickly and, in, and have them decompose in aerobic ways. So that's a way to quickly uh, reduce our carbon footprint, but also bring that to the washing stations and the communities where we operate. So the farmers, of course, if we bring pulp back directly to the farmers, you know, where and how do you apply that and how do we improve the nutrient recycling? But we try to, to guide and train farmers on that. And actually a lot of that R&D even, and the knowledge that goes to the farmers in the end, comes actually from, from partnerships that we have with, with SEAT and IAT through the SEGAS project, with Sustainable Food Lab, and the people here on this call. Uh, many of them actually are, are also our partners at one point in time. Uh, with universities and of course also when it comes to implementation and scaling we often try to team up with NGOs. So this is a way how we try to implement um, our CSA practices. Next slide. Thanks. And so why do we do that? I already talked a little bit about our leadership. So our, uh, our uh, CEO is currently heading the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and he says you know it's also the right thing to do. It's not just protecting our business and that of the suppliers in the long term. But, you know, we have to take our responsibility with the, the role of, of agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions, with, you know, the poverty that is still um, um, uh, very important in many of the smallholder supply communities from which we source. So basically, we feel that, you know, it's the right thing to do. And that pressure, let's say, also comes down, of course, of pressure. You know, it's, it's of course, I find it ex excellent, but we have, of course, trading teams. Not everybody grew up, you know, let's say, with, with that type of logic. So we actually, we do see, of course, as we go on the ground in the implementation, that uh, these targets that are being set by our leadership, you know, have to, of course, then be implemented by the team. So that vision from the leadership is very important to drive that. And then, of course, we do have increasing customer demand. We are basically a B2B, a business-to-business -business company. But even, you know, our roasters, for example, will often ask, you know, uh, for sustainability, uh, not only certificates, you know, or certified coffees or cocoa, but also sometimes more issues around child labor, for example, in, in cocoa in West Africa, or issues even around climate change. And so for us to be able to have these clients and to have their stickiness and sometimes, but not always, you know, collect premiums, it's good that we invest in the CSA and we show that we are part of that. And of course, the shareholders, um, uh, they basically want to see that Olam, of course, is a leader in this sustainability domain because that creates also value. So in many cases, you know, you have the value of the company is not related to the bottom line. I guess companies like Tesla and, and Amazon and, and Uber, many of these companies have never ever made a profit, but they are extremely valuable just because of course, the, the value that shareholders and of course the stock market attributes to them. And so for us, you know, it is something that we have to take into account as a company. 
Uh, and then, of course, more practically on the ground, it is important that we basically are part of the sustainability activities and that we show also that we are ready to invest and lead sometimes in that. And that does help us, of course, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily a license to operate, you know, but it, gives, it does give us more legitimacy to operate in the areas where we work. And of course, last but not least, I think probably the least important are the co-funding opportunities. Actually, we often have the feeling that donors are more knocking on our door trying to get the private sector to be involved in their projects than that we are doing it the other way around. But of course, the co-funding does often provide opportunities to access knowledge through these knowledge partnerships that I was mentioning earlier or services that help us to scale. So that's the story from Olan. Thanks so much, Pete. And thanks to everybody. It's really nice to have been able to hear from three different companies working in different segments and with different roles in the supply chain. I think that was that was really valuable. We are running a bit out of time right now. Um, so if you do have questions, we can take maybe one or two if you want to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and as we get to those, I do just want to point out that we have a resources page. You can find these on the, on the GCP website. Um, so the it usually takes a day or two for the whole webinar to post. You can either look at either just the slides or at the um, or listen to the entire webinar itself. And these are the other um, charts that I said would be in the resources as well. Oh yeah, if there are any questions, um, you can also raise your hand uh, if you would like to speak directly. Otherwise, uh, type your questions in. Um, and while we wait to, to see if, if questions do come in, um, I do think it's just important for everyone to be thinking, you know, if you're on these webinars, you're already thinking about climate investment and, and why it's important, and how it can happen. But it's really important to think about what really needs to happen to move more investment in climate adaptation and, and how we can get to that sector shift that I was talking about earlier. You know, there's still a lot of challenges in the way, but being able to identify those and overcome those as, um, as is the case with counterculture coffees and with co-op coffees and with Olam, um, who are all kind of working through these challenges and really finding that business case to lock in uh, climate investment. Kili? Kili, we lost you. Kili, we can't hear you anymore. Apologies, my no. internet just went out for a little bit and my Zoom closed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, just think it's really important for, for companies and NGOs alike to keep on thinking about these problems and how we can, how we can get to that, that sector shift. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Caroline if there aren't any questions. Any uh, other thank questions? you. Um, also from my side, big thank you to you, Keely, uh, to Pete, Monica, and Meredith, and um, Christian for jumping in. Um, it was super interesting to understand the reasons how you come to investing into climate smart agriculture and also the different approaches. Um, looking at our series, as I mentioned, coming to an end. Um, so next time, which will be beginning of December, we will be looking at what Keely has just mentioned, uh, collaboration. Um, also, I think it was a quote from Nestle, you have said, uh, coming to that critical mass um, is quite interesting. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, that uh, in Honduras, um, we have uh, very promising approaches there. Um, also, uh, we, uh, the Global Coffee Platform is holding its annual Global Coffee Sustainability Conference in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And uh, the uh, Climate Smart Agriculture will also be, have a short part in there and uh, this learning series and ARC will also be mentioned. Um, that's November 8th happening. Otherwise, our next uh, webinar on how collaboration can work, um, bringing action to origin, uh, we will be back on uh, December 6th. 
And uh, with that, I'm almost closing. If you could uh, go to the last slide, please. Um, usually here you uh, would have seen, so if there are any questions, please feel free to get back to me or Keely or any of the speakers. Usually you had seen the picture here of Kate Sodengia, um, who, who accompanied the webinar series so far. Um, Kate has decided to move into another area, uh, into health. And um, so her predecessor is Stefan Ruger, who has been listening in today as well. Um, so she has moved on nevertheless. This uh, series will finish and we will keep uh, working uh, together, ARC, the Alliance for Resilient Coffee, and the Global Coffee Platform uh, to build these cases in Honduras and Uganda. So we hope to see you again in about um, yeah, a little bit than uh, four weeks time, beginning of uh, December. And with that, I thank you everyone for your participation and uh, the speakers for your contribu contribution. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you again, beginning of December. Bye-bye.